A few years ago, Kristen did a fantastic presentation on RFID of all sorts at ShmooCon, and one of the pieces of it was an active defense system called Guard Bunny. And she is going to talk about Guard Bunny as well as showing that it is out and released into the wild so that anybody can make one of these. And it's a very interesting because it is, in fact, an active defense system. So it's great pleasure that, that I will introduce Kristen here to talk about Guard Bunny. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Ah, thank you for coming. Um, let me start out by, by giving thanks to a few people. Um, Guard Bunny wouldn't exist without certain folks. Um, first of all, JP. Um, when Guard Bunny was created at a, at a startup I was a part of, um, JB, JP did all of the initial PCB design. He did a lot of work on the antennas. Um, we learned a lot about how PCB trace antennas work in RFID because of JP. It wouldn't be what it is today without him. Thank you, JP. Um, Henry and the Recursion crew. Recursion was my startup, and Recursion was the vehicle that allowed Guard Bunny to, to come about. So, you know, again, Guard Bunny wouldn't exist without Recursion. Uh, I know some of the Recursion crew are here. Thank you all. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, Salesforce, my employer. Um, when I was accepted uh, to speak at ShmooCon, I was really blown away by the level of support that I got from Salesforce. Um, they paid for all of my PCBs, they paid for my parts, they paid for my prototypes, they're paying for me to come here. Um, they actually tried really hard to, to build a working guard bunny to go into everyone's swag bag, but we just we couldn't do it because there wasn't enough time. So I've, I've been completely blown away by you know, the commitment that Salesforce has shown. So thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Salesforce. Um, I should also say we are hiring on both coasts and various other places. So uh, if you want to work for a company that values you as a person as well as as a job function, please send me an email. Um, I've talked to a lot of engineers about Guard Bunny. It's, it's, for, for a few years, it's been the kind of thing that any time I've met up with anyone who knows anything about the low levels of RFID, I pick their brain about some of the problems that I've been facing here. So this, this isn't all me. I, I, I owe a lot of credit to a lot of people who've given me ideas for, for, for ways to improve things. Um, but last but by no means least, uh, my wife, Erin. I know she's watching. Hi, babe. Um, a little known fact about me, I cannot solder surface mount technology for shit. I just, I suck at it. I get, I, I, my hands are too big, I just, I can't do it. So anytime I, I build a new device, I get a pile of PCBs, a pile of components, and I, I give her a few days work. And she's amazing at it. She, she never gets bored of it, so thanks, babe. All right, let's get on with it. So uh, let's start with a little theory about Guard Bunny. Um, first off, what is it? What, what is Guard Bunny? It's an active RFID shield. What do I mean by that? So conventional RFID shields, the way that they work is they try to surround the, uh, the tag with metal in such a way that all of the incident energy is absorbed by that metal and doesn't reach the tag. The problem with it is these things that they, they call Faraday cages, they're not actual Faraday cages unless you ground it. And so because none of these shields are grounded, if you hit them with enough power, you can charge the shield itself. And then the shield becomes effectively an, a, an RF proxy to the tag that's inside it. So essentially, if you hit it with enough power, you saturate the shield, you punch through, you read the tag. Guard Bunny takes a different approach. Guard Bunny absorbs that signal, and it uses it. It, it spits out energy back at the reader. So if you put more energy into Guard Bunny, Guard Bunny just starts shouting louder. Um, it doesn't matter how much energy you put into it. I mean, eventually there's a, there's a failure case that we'll, we'll discuss, but um, it's, in general, better at handling stronger signals than any passive shield that exists. Um, Guard Bunny is a lot like an RFID tag. It, it has a lot of characteristics that make it very RFID-like. It also has a lot of characteristics that, that kind of make it very not RFID-like. Um, we'll, we'll get into that, but for the context of, of or for the purpose of this talk, um, when I say RFID or contactless or NFC, they're all the same thing. Um, I'm working very, very low level in, in the ISO 14443 stack. So at this level, they're all the same thing. So, you know, yes, this is for Clipper cards, and yes, this is for your iClass card to get into your building, and it's for your contactless payment, and it's your passport. If it runs at 13.56 megahertz, 
it's, it's you know, Guard Bunny's target technology. So when I say it's a little different from an RFID tag, what do I mean? Well, first off, if you compare, you know, Guard Bunny, um, and you can see the, the, the bunny logo. I love the, the caffeinated eyes. It's one of my favorite things. Um, if you compare Guard Bunny to My Fair Classic and iClass, say, just, you know, two, two very popular tags, um, they're all passively powered. They all receive their power from the reader. They have no power sources of their own. They're active devices. They have chips in them. They, they have transistors. They switch. They make decisions about how to operate. They communicate via load modulation. What I mean by that is the, the reader is putting out energy, and the tag is deciding how much to consume. And if it consumes more, then the, the signal that the reader drops. If it consumes less, the, reader, the signal that the reader comes up, then you can use that to transfer data. That's load modulation. All of these devices communicate via load modulation, including Guard Bunny. Where things start to get a little bit different is when you look at how much memory they have. Um, My Fair Classic and iClass, you can both get, you can get both of these technologies with up to four kilobytes of, of, uh, of storage. Guard Bunny has four bits. That's it. Four bits of memory. Half a byte. That's, that's enough to do what it does. Um, likewise, uh, that memory is, not, is volatile. So the moment the power goes away, those four bits just kind of vanish into the ether. There is no non-volatile storage on Guard Bunny anywhere. There is also no CPU on Guard Bunny anywhere. Um, no, no processor at all. It's, it, it, it is incapable of executing code of any kind. So what is it actually doing? Well, the flow of operation is, you start with an antenna. And you tune up the antenna. It's, it's a fairly standard RFID thing. It's an it's a inductor and a capacitor, and you, you make them resonate, and, and it's a thing. Um, from the antenna, you extract power, and you regulate that with a power supply. Once you've got power coming out of the power supply, you use it to power a 4-bit counter. That 4-bit counter has an output that's driving a modulator. The modulator is ultimately controlled by a limiter, and the limiter then interacts back with the tuned antenna. So you've got this giant loop of, uh, if you look at it kind of at the top side, it's, it's uh, power management, and at the bottom side, it's signal management. So it's, 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 it's fairly simple operation. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get into the, the exact specifics in just a moment here. Why are we using a four-bit counter? Well, if you look at the ISO 14443 specifications, they use an FC16 subcarrier. So what that means is, the, the data isn't directly modulated onto the 13.56 megahertz carrier. You modulate a 847 kilohertz subcarrier signal onto the, 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 the primary 13.56 carrier. So effectively, um, you know, 847 kilohertz is 13.56 megahertz divided by 16. It's the frequency of the carrier divided by 16, FC16. FC16 is critical in all ISO 14443 applications. Uh, whether it's type A or type B, it doesn't matter. They're all based on ISO 14443. Even things like iClass, that um, it's not 14443 compliant, it, it still uses some of the lower layers, and it still uses FC16 modulation. So FC16 is critical, and um, we've got a 4-bit counter. So a 4-bit counter has 16 possible states, which means that there are 16 things that it can do, and if you take that output signal that oscillates every you know, 16 cycles, and you feed it into a modulator, you're now modulating at FC16. So Guard Bunny is effectively just clocking out ISO 14443 compliant modulation. That's all it's doing. It's just spitting out FC16. Why? Well, the tag's communicating via FC16. Guard Bunny's spitting out FC16. If you put the two together, the reader can't tell them apart. And the simple idea is that a lot of these tags, the, the exchanges are cryptographic. So if Guard Bunny can induce enough noise that I flip a single bit, the crypto fails, the reader gives up, the whole thing aborts, and Guard Bunny wins. If I can desynchronize the timing of the reader and the tag, maybe I can phase shift it by four cycles. At that point, the reader can't communicate with the tag anymore, and Guard Bunny wins. There's any number of different, different uh, failure scenarios that I could induce into the communication between reader and tag by injecting FC16 that you know, any one of them would work. So 
I don't necessarily need to be the loudest device. I don't need to, to silence the energy. I don't need to obliterate the signal. All I have to be is loud enough to be heard for one bit somewhere in the transaction. And that's what Guard Bunny does. Loud enough to be heard is good enough. That's, that's essentially what it comes down to. So how does it work? I was always taught that when you're talking about how something works, you should always start with a schematic. Um, and I'm just going to kind of ramble on for a second here about nothing in particular so that the electrical engineers in the audience can look at that and wonder what the hell I'm doing. So <laughs> I will walk through this stage by stage, but I, I did want to kind of put the whole thing up uh, just for a moment for people to see. Um, we'll come back to it in a, in a moment. So let's walk through the various stages. So first off, you've got the antenna. It's, it's nothing particularly special. It's a resonant circuit. It's, it's a typical RFID antenna. Um, the thing that's strange about this is the short circuit around L1. Um, the reason for this is because in EagleCAD, there's no way to mark a wire as having an inductance. And so what you have to do is put an inductor and then short it with a wire because the wire actually is the antenna. But you, it gets crazy because now these two nets are shorted together in a way that they're actually not. And the wire kind of is a wire. It's like a wire that goes all the way around the board, so it's kind of correct. It just, it, it's a screwy thing about Eagle. Um, electrically, it's kind of correct, but it's still, it still it doesn't look right. Um, tuning these things is tricky. Um, if you want to build one, um, the, give you an example. If you were to stick an oscilloscope probe on the antenna and then uh, hit it with 13.56 megahertz, you're not going to be able to tune it. Because in this case, this, this particular board, it requires a 52 picofarad in, uh, capacitor to tune it. Well, the input for your oscilloscope has probably got 10 to 15 picofarads of capacitance on that, so you've now completely screwed up your tuning. It's, you actually have to build out the entire device and measure the voltage that comes out of the, the power supply at the back end in order to be decoupled enough that, that you can reasonably measure the tuning. Um, it's, it's good to use one board, sandwich it together, and one drives the other so your, your antennas match up. Um, it's happy to have a long conversation with anyone who, who wants to design RFID antennas on PCBs. I've, I've learned many hard lessons over the years. So the next stage is the power supply, and this is where the, the, the party really starts. So you can think of this as two halves of a full wave rectifier. So at the top, you've got a positive phase. At the bottom, you've got a negative phase. And the line in the middle, you can think of as a ground. So each half, if we look at the top half of that, um, C1, C2, D1, D2, um, those actually form a classic voltage doubler. And so in addition to rectifying AC to DC, each half doubles the voltage. And then you've got two halves, so that doubles the voltage again. So with very few components, I've got a voltage quadrupler. Even better than that, um, if you look at the arrangement of, say, D1 and D2, um, D1 has a forward voltage drop of, you know, it's a diode, 0.7 volts, which means that if the signal on my antenna is less than 0.7 volts, I'm not going to get anything out of the power supply. And then you look at D1, uh, look at D2. D2 actually upward biases that point to compensate for the forward voltage drop. So overall, there is no forward voltage drop from any of the diodes, and you've got a voltage quadrupler. So you've got a very, very efficient power supply, very good at getting, at, at, you know, getting high voltage enough to, to turn on chips from you know, just a few hundred millivolts of input. At the very end of the power supply, you've got the LEDs. Um, the LEDs actually serve as voltage regulators. So um, if you imagine, like I said, the middle line is ground, top line is positive, bottom line is negative, you connect your logic between the two, um, you've got kind of twice each phase. So those two LEDs in series, uh, in this version I'm using red LEDs, so those typically have a forward voltage of about 1.8 volts. Two of those in series means you've got 3.6 volts, and that's the voltage my logic runs at. If it gets any higher, the LEDs conduct, shunt the power away, and light up. So they, they, they serve a couple, uh, couple good purposes, both as an alert and as a, as a voltage regulator. Um, the 4-bit counter I mentioned, it's, it's really not special. It's any old 4-bit counter will work. I've, I've used three or four in, in Guard Bunny and had no problems. Um, as long as it's a binary counter, because you want divide by 16, not divide by 10. Um, the key specification is turn on voltage. Uh, this particular logic family turns on around 2 volts. 
Um, you can get logic families that turn on lower voltage, but they start getting really, really, really expensive for not that much benefit. Um, there, there comes a point where you just, you might have enough voltage to technically turn on, but you don't have enough current to power the thing. You don't have enough power overall. So, you know, to, to, to some extent, two volts is about the sweet spot. Um, you'll notice on the left, the, uh, the clear load ENP and ENT wires are all shorted together and go up to the, the positive rail. I have no idea what those pins do. Um, all I know is that the data sheet said, if you don't connect these four pins to the positive rail, your counter will not count. So, you know, I, I, I have had occasions where I've burned PCBs because I didn't read the data sheet for the counter and I didn't short the right pins. So do check your data sheets on this. Um, and also make sure it'll take a 13.56 megahertz clock. Um, a lot of the lower voltage um, logic families, the speed that they can operate at decreases as voltage decreases. And so a lot of them, you get down to, to kind of two volt levels and they'll only clock at five megahertz. So, you know, things get a little screwy down there. Um, the modulator is effectively just a switch. That's all it is. It's a switch that's controlled by an electrical signal. It's actually two MOSFETs back to back, but uh, they, they make them in nice little packages that you don't have to worry about pairing them at all. Um, switching speed and, and voltage rating are crucial, obviously. Uh, you don't want to go releasing any magic smoke. You don't want to be uh, switching slower than the signal needs to go. Um, the basic logic is um, the, the, the E input on pin four, that's the enable. Uh, when the enable pin goes high, pins one and two, Y and Z are shorted together and current can flow. It's, it's that simple, that's all it does. It's, they're actually very handy parts. So you take pin one to the top of the coil, pin two to the bottom of the coil, and you now have a load modulator. It's not complicated. The problem with load modulating that way is, if you imagine um, you've got your counter, and the, the, the counter counts up, and eventually switches the modulator on. The modulator shorts the coil together, and uh, the signal stops. The problem is the signal has now stopped. So you've got no counter input. You've got no clock going to the counter. So the clock will stop ticking, and it will never turn off the modulator. So what you've got to do is make sure that there's at least a minimum bit of voltage present on the coil so that you can drive the clock input, so that you can actually modulate. And that's what these two diodes do. Um, effectively, they guarantee that at least the forward voltage drop of a diode is present on the coil, and you're off to the races. So bringing it all back together, I mean, that's, you know, 10 minutes of, of electrical theory, and I've just explained the entire device from first principles. Um, it's, it's really not a complicated thing. It's, it's amazing how simple things get when you, you do them in analog. Um, sometimes the, the, the math behind it gets kind of crazy, but it's, life's easier when you don't have to write code. Okay, so demo time. Um, I actually have three demos to show you. Um, so let's get cracking. First off, this is a, a, a standard off-the-shelf um, commercial um, contactless credit card reader. You probably see these in shops. You can buy them on eBay for about 50, 60 bucks. And this is a, a, an expired, before you get that idea, um, <laughs> contactless credit card that was issued to me by Chase. And if you apply one to the other, it beeps. And you can keep making a beep as long as you like, and it's quite happy. And then enter guard bunny. So what we can do is, if I, if I sit guard bunny on top of the contactless credit card, and then I hold both of them to the reader, no beep. Shit. <laughs> it's a V1 device. Sometimes it's better than others, but you can see in principle it, 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 it shields it. So this is a relatively high energy reader. This is putting, about, putting out about a quarter of a watt of, of energy. And you can see it lights up the, the LEDs on Guard Bunny quite nicely. Um, the next demo I want to show is with uh, my cell phone. Because my cell phone has an NFC reader in it, which as I mentioned is exactly the same thing, but in this case it's just a little lower power. Uh, where this guy is putting out, about, putting out about 250 milliwatts, this is putting out about 50. So if I take my clipper card and I swipe it to the phone, it beeps. If I take Guard Bunny and I sit it on the clipper card and I 
present it to the phone, nothing happens. So again, it works at low energy levels as well. But you can see that the, the LEDs aren't lighting up at all. There isn't enough power to, to actually need that, that load regulation, so the, the LEDs just stay off. Um, you'll hear me from time to time refer to them as eyes. The original idea was that the, uh, the, the bunny logo with the super caffeinated eyes would have the LEDs in the middle of it. So, you know, just for extra caffeine. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, it, it works with, I've tested it with iClass tags, I've tested it with half a dozen different tags on half a dozen different readers, um, with the exception of the occasional prototype glitch. Um, it, it, it basically works. Um, what I do want to show you, though, um, for the, the final demo, is how it fails. And, okay, I guess you've kind of already seen that demo. <laughs> So we'll, we'll try again anyway. So I've got my, my contactless card and my guard bunny, and it doesn't read. If I offset them a little bit, like so, it reads. Took, took a little finagling, but it read. If I offset them a little more, it, it's easy to read. That's one of the big ways in which guard bunny fails. Um, the antenna on this has to be coincident with the antenna on this in order to get decent protection. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that now. So I, wanna, I wanted to use that as kind of a segue into um, some of the improvements that are possible with Guard Bunny. It's, as I mentioned, it's, it's a V1 device, it's a prototype, it's proof of concept. Um, but it, it has potential. So what kind of things can we do with it to improve it? Well, I, I mentioned the antenna geometry. Uh, if the antenna geometry doesn't match, then you, you've got a potential problem. Um, there's some things that we can do to, to, to help improve that and some clever PSU, uh, some clever tricks with the power supply that, uh, that might uh, make things even better. Um, the counter chip, there's a, there's a really ugly but really subtle and really strange problem with the, um, with the counter chip that I'll, I'll come back to um, that needs a, a, a slightly strange approach to solve it, but it, it is solvable. Um, the modulator itself, the, the way that it works at the moment, it, it could be improved, so I'll, I'll talk about that a little. Um, the power supply, I, I'm actually kind of in love with this power supply. It's, it's kind of awesome. One of the things that I like about it is that if you take a guard bunny and you take the chips off, there's now nothing consuming power except the LEDs. And so you've actually got a really efficient RFID detector. So if I hold up my, my contactless card, and I've, I've, this is a guard bunny with just the power supply and the LEDs, you can see it starts, okay, that's the bright thing. <laughs> As Adam Savage would say, there's your problem. All right, let's try this again. So uh, if I bring the reader closer, there's the, light, the eyes lighting up from this far away. Um, in fact, if I sit guard bunny on a table next to a reader, the eyes light up. It's, it's a really efficient power supply. It works really well, um, but there's always room for improvement. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and then additional alerts. There's, there's some interesting possibilities to have some fun with the alerting on Guard Bunny. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little. Um, so let's talk a bit about magnetic flux. So Guard Bunny is a coil. The, the, the trace that goes around the edge of the PCB is a coil. And the way the coils work is, if you look at them side on, like in this picture, you have lines of magnetic flux coming up through the middle of the coil. And they run, they, they run around the coil in, in kind of a donut shape. And the, essentially the problem is, if I have two tags that are offset like this, and I apply magnetic flux to one of them, the, the one on the left and the one on the right won't see the same amount of flux because you know, not all of the flux lines are being captured by the antennas in the same way. What that means is the flux doesn't match between the two devices, which means that the available power doesn't match between the two devices, and you've now got a mismatch between device A and device B, and it's possible to power device B but not device A. So it's, it, it's kind of a, 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 a pretty serious weakness. It's God Bunny's biggest problem at the moment. Fortunately, there's, there's a series of fixes that range from easy to, oh my god, wizardry electronics um, that, that can address it. Um, the, the basic solution is to use lots of antennas. 
if I'm offset like, like, like this, if I actually have two antennas, one that's here and one that's here, um, you know, I've, I've got a good set of matching with, with this flux. So, you know, maybe that'll give me better protection. So if I have lots and lots and lots of antennas, the more antennas I have, the more accurately I can match Guard Bunny's antenna geometry to the tag's antenna geometry and maybe stand a better chance of, of preventing the read. So the crude way to do it is you just copy and paste multiple copies of Guard Bunny onto a PCB. Um, there's not a lot of components here. You could easily fit um, probably, um, probably 12, maybe 15 Guard Bunnies on a single a single circuit board. Y you can see the, the space I've used for components here is relatively small, and I could have compressed that down a lot more. So you can put a lot of complete guard bunnies on one single device. Um, and it's kind of crude, though, because at that point, each device has its own clock. And well, clocks are kind of a universal thing. So um, a better approach would be to give each antenna its own power supply, combine the power supplies in series so that we get the highest voltage we possibly can, and then power one, one counter chip. So that, that, that's not too difficult, we can do that. And then the ultimate would be to manipulate the phase of the antennas themselves. So if you imagine, if you consider like the, the coils in these two, and I'm hitting them with a magnetic field, if the devices are like this, they will be perfectly in phase. If the devices are beside each other, they will be perfectly out of phase. And so as they overlap more or less, there's a phase shift from zero to 180. So what you need to do in order to combine all of these antennas is to phase shift each antenna at the antenna level and then combine them into one big antenna that you then use with one power supply and one counter again. Now, that's a, a level of RF widget, wizardry that exceeds me by some significant margin. So I'll talk about it, but I, I'm not going to be building it anytime soon. Um, and then with all of these, the, you just treat it as one big antenna. So you modulate them all as one antenna together. Um, it's, it's a relatively simple approach, and it should be fairly effective. Um, I mentioned the counter input. So if you look at the, um, the, the schematic that's up now, uh, the, the very top rail is the, uh, the raw coil voltage. Um, and you can see that's driving the clock input on the, um, on the counter chip. Well, the reason for that is because when the voltage at the coil is very, very low, you still want to be able to see the, 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 count, the, the clock ticking. Um, typically, the clock being able to tick is what limits Guard Bunny's ability to turn on at low energy. It's, it's the size of that, that, that oscillation on the, the, the coil. The problem is when you start getting very, very close to the reader and voltages start going way up, that starts exceeding the allowable input voltage range for the chip, at which point the protection diodes kick in and they shunt away all of that excess power to ground. This gives us two things going on. Firstly, we're bleeding power away. We're just wasting power, we're shunting it to ground. Uh, that's good power that we could be using to generate more modulation. Um, but instead, we're just shunting it to ground. So that's, that's not optimal. Um, secondly, you, you're not really supposed to use the protection diodes on logic inputs like this. Like, they work, and, and you can, and you can get away with it, but um, it makes things much more sensitive to static. Um, I've blown up a bunch of these things with static. Um, she says, touching the grounded metal podium again. Um, and it just, it, it's just generally not a good idea. So the way to fix it is not with a traditional power supply circuit. Because if you take a, a, a resistor and a xenodiode, the way that that circuit works is, once you get above the voltage of the xenodiode, the xena conducts shunts the power to ground. We don't want to be shunting away power. So how do we do this? The solution is clever impedance trickery. Um, we want low impedance at low voltage so that the signal can just get straight through because we want the chip to turn on quickly. At high voltage, we want high impedance because we want to limit how much power is getting to that chip. Um, we also, you know, we're, we're very picky about our power. We're trying to be very efficient, so we don't want it to be shunted. So what do you do? This, this doesn't really sound like any common power supply approach. And then you start doing crazy things with 7805s. Um, how many people have ever seen this arrangement of a, of a, of a constant voltage regulator? Oh, a couple. I'm impressed. So if you use a, a constant voltage regulator like this, you actually turn it into a constant current regulator. 
So what you can do is, if you use a voltage regulator like this, and you turn it into a constant current regulator, you look up the input current for the chip that you're using, and you regulate to exactly that much current. And everything else is just taken care of. If the voltage gets too high, well, okay, I'm a voltage regulator. I can deal with that. It's, it's a really neat trick that I'm, I'm really irritated I didn't think of myself. Um, so, I mean, obviously you wouldn't use a 7805 because, you know, it wouldn't really fit well with the 0201s on the circuit board. Um, so you'd use some kind of, you know, high efficiency LDO regulator. Um, there is an odd thing about picking a voltage if you're implementing this circuit. Um, your voltage has to be high enough that it's going to trip the, the input logic thresholds on the counter. But the higher the voltage is, the more power is going through that resistor and the more power you're wasting just heating that resistor up. So there's a very fine balance to be struck, and you have to be a little, a little careful with um, how that works, especially because of the dynamic range problem of you know, very, very low energy versus very, very high energy, and you have to work at both. Um, the modulator I mentioned. Um, at the moment, the way that it works is, essentially, if the power supply has too much power, dump it through the LEDs. If the modulator is on, short circuit the coil. And you've got these two things that are kind of independent. Um, it's much easier to build that way, but um, what happens is a high energy, way too much power goes to the LEDs. So if you look, you know, if I just take guard bunny and my, my high power reader, you can see when it's up close, those, those LEDs are pretty bright. I mean, if I do the one without the, the modulator, um, that's, I chose these LEDs specifically because they have a 180 degree field of view. Um, the ones that I've used in the past with a 10 degree field of view, like this, they are blinding. Um, it turns out if you, uh, these guys are actually switching on and off at 13.56 megahertz. And it turns out that if you drive LEDs that way, you can way overdrive them miles out of specification and they don't blow up. And that's exactly what's happening here. <laughs> They're being driven way out of spec, but because they, they get half a phase to recover every time, they, they don't care. They're quite happy. Ooh, that was a fun noise. Um, so yes, you, you don't want to dump too much power to the LEDs. It's, just, it's, it's a waste of modulation, ultimately. Um, and it's all about the modulation depth. So instead, another approach that you could take, allow the power supply to charge endlessly. Um, just go up and up and up and up and up in voltage. Now, bear in mind, without the LEDs on this, um, the power supply here can easily reach 200 volts. We're not talking about small voltages. We're talking about fairly high voltages that when you charge up decent sized caps, you've actually got a good amount of energy stored there. Um, so you allow that to charge up, and then when the modulator turns on, you just dump that power into the LEDs then. The idea being that once you dump all of that power into the LEDs, the power supply needs to charge up again, which means that it pulls power from the antenna, which means that the voltage on the antenna drops, and you're now load modulating again. So it's kind of um, exploiting the, um, uh, the, the back propagation of power consumption through back to the antenna, which, okay, it's probably gonna be slightly out of phase, but that might not be a bad thing. Because maybe sometimes, my, my job here is to confuse the reader. So if one cycle I generate FC15, and another cycle I generate FC17, I don't know what the reader's gonna do with that, but I'm pretty sure it's not gonna like it. If I do it a thousand times in quick succession, I, I might have a chance of blocking the read. So, okay, fine, not a problem. Um, the power supply itself, I, I mentioned that I, I, I quite like the power supply. It, it works very well. It's, uh, there's no uncompensated diode drops. It's very high efficiency. It's got a 4X multiplier in there that doesn't actually work out to a 4X multiplier because you know efficiency happens. Um, but it's, it certainly gives you a lot more voltage out than you put into it. It's, it, it's, a, it's a good power supply. Um, even aside of the, the trickery with the modulator, we could avoid dumping power to the LEDs a different way just by, again, putting a constant current regulator on them. Uh, that wouldn't actually cost us anything. It's just a couple more components on the board between the power supply and the LEDs. Uh, that, that would work fairly well. Um, I mentioned that we've got a 4X voltage multiplier. We could actually go for higher multiples if we wanted to. Um, I haven't experimented with it because there comes a point where um, the, the, the efficiency drops so much that um, you're not actually getting any net, net gain from going to higher multipliers. I think that's about where I'm at. I'm about on that balance point, but um, th there may be fun to be had there. I, I don't know. Um, and then likewise, switch mode power supplies. Switch mode is notoriously good with taking very, very low voltages and doing useful things with them. Um, the problem is I'm already in a switching environment. 
So I've got a 13.56 megahertz signal. Who knows, maybe I could drive my switcher at uh, you know, FC16 frequencies. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not much of a switch mode engineer, so I, I haven't really tackled the problem. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is that um, in RFID, you're talking about a magnetic field. So the field strength drops off as the inverse cube of the distance from the reader, which means that since power is the square of voltage, um, and voltage is directly related to the, uh, the, the magnetic field strength, your available power drops off as the sixth power of distance. So by the time you're getting far away, you are on tiny, tiny, tiny fractions of power. And it doesn't really matter how many volts you bump it up to, there just aren't enough joules. You just don't have the energy to do anything no matter what the voltage actually is. So like I said, the, the power supply as far as I'm aware is reasonably optimal, but I'd, I'd love to be proved wrong. Um, alerting options. So at the moment you have the, the, the LEDs, um, but you also have a counter. Another way to think of a counter is as a frequency divider. So what you could do is instead of taking a 4-bit counter and dividing by 16, you could take a 10-bit counter and divide by 1024. That takes you from 13.56 megahertz to about 13 kilohertz, and now you're in audio frequencies. So if you look at bits, uh, bits 10 to 14, they're all in the audio frequency range, and you could just wire that directly up to a piezo sounder. Um, what you could even do, um, you can see I put a, a little logic equation up here. If you were to take uh, Q16, which is a very slow, um, uh, you know, uh, least significant bit uh, changing, um, if you were to use that to select between two of the other tones, um, I'm pretty sure you could do that with like three logic gates, um, and then you've got a two-tone siren even. So there's, there's all kinds of stuff that you can do. Um, there, there's definitely enough power to drive a Bluetooth low energy chip. So um, you could absolutely put a BLE chip on there so that every time Guard Bunny wakes up, it pings your phone and says, hey, there's an RFID field, you're being read. Uh, that, that would absolutely work. Um, and the, the great thing is, um, because the power supply in Guard Bunny is so flexible, if you don't have enough power to drive the BLE chip, all you do is you increase the size of the tank capacitors on the power supply, and well, now you've got enough power. It, it, it's, it's not hard. BLE is very low energy. It's, it's very well suited to, to this application. There's also lots of user interface possibilities, um, even in a card form factor. Um, how many people have heard of COIN? Yeah? Okay, so COIN is this, this credit card size device that um, it, it, it does funky things with your credit cards that you, you probably don't want to know about, but um, it, the, the, the point is it's, it's a, a, a normal ISO standard credit card size form factor device with a button and a screen and a battery and a CPU and a BLE radio. You can use all of these things on Guard Bunny. So it's absolutely, you know, lots and lots and lots of possibilities to put a, maybe put a screen on it and show how many times your cards have been read. Something like that. I, I don't know. There's, there's lots that you could do. Um, failure modes. How does Guard Bunny fail? Um, there's four main ways that Guard Bunny can fail. Um, first and foremost is the antenna's not matching. Now, we, we, we talked about that a little bit. Um, what I don't think is that, I don't think there, there can ever be a perfect antenna design. I think the, the problem is too complex. There's too many possibilities of, of, um, uh, of, of too many possibilities of antenna A and antenna B combining. Um, it's entirely possible that someone could prove me wrong. Please do. Um, all I'm looking for is good enough. So let's let's you know. It would be nice to to, to try out some different antenna designs and find one that's good enough. Um, what happens if you put way 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 too much power into it? Well, the first thing that happens is the LEDs will die first. They, they are the voltage limiters. So um, eventually, they're just going to stop working. Um, they will probably fail open. So they, they won't fail short. They'll fail open, uh, which means that now you've got nothing limiting the voltage in the power supply. Voltage in the power supply goes up and up and up and up and up and up and up. And when it starts getting into the 200 voltage range, um, the chips will already be dead. So. Um, you know, if you keep putting more power into it, that voltage, you know, voltage quadrupler, um, you, you, the chips will die. Eventually, the power supply caps will die, and that's probably the point at which you'll actually see magic smoke being released. Um, when, you, when you overcharge those little surface mount devices, they, they sometimes go off like little firecrackers. Uh, little teeny tiny weeny firecrackers. Adorable little things. Anyway, um, after that, um, you're... you're, you're you're long dead at that point. The moment that the chip's died, you're not generating FC16, so you've, you've got no functionality. 
Um, you could protect against this very easily by adding a high voltage Zener diode across the, the power supply. If you just kind of crowbar that and say, you know what, if I get to 100 volts on the power supply, just, just kill it, please. Um, but then that itself can be hit with more power and eventually that will die. But I think that's the point at which if you're able to kill your high voltage Zener diode that's protecting Guard Bunny, when Guard Bunny dies, I'm pretty sure the next thing to die is going to be your RFID tag. So as long as Guard Bunny dies before the RFID tag dies, we still win. Um, another couple of good attacks that, that would work, um, digital signal processing could separate the Guard Bunny modulation from the tag modulation. They're not at the same volume, so you could key on that, and they're not at the same phase, so you could key on that. Um, that would probably work. And I mentioned static electricity. Um, the counter on these is, is particularly bad. So what do you need to know if you want to build a Guard Bunny? Um, it's, first off, it's designed to fit in a clamshell case. Um, you've probably seen the, the prox cards that are very thick um, RFID tags. Um, Guard Bunny is designed to fit inside that, that style of case. If you put it on a, a flex PCB, um, you use all of the, the TSSOP parts, the, the 1.2 millimeter thick, it, it should fit. So um, you could do that if you wanted to. Um, approximate production costs, if you're building 10, expect $100 a board. If you're building 1,000, they go, up to about, go down to about $10 a board. Um, if you're building 10,000, including assembly, uh, you can probably build them for five bucks a board. Uh, if you're building more than that, they, they get progressively cheaper, but um, I've not even looked into how cheaply you could build it if you go real scale. Um, no production house will have any kind of problem with any of these parts. Um, I'll, I'll be uploading a bill of materials, Gerber files, you know, everything you need to go to a fab house with it. Um, and there's nothing on there that will give anyone a heartache. Um, 0603 is it's, it's huge. It's massive components that are teeny tiny weeny, but massive by comparison. Um, SOD 523 is teeny teeny weeny tiny. It's genuinely small, but, you know, they don't care about them. So, yeah, it's, it's very easy to take it to a, a fab house and get it made. Um, component selection. Um, if you're going to build it, um, the tuning caps are very, very critical. You've got to use uh, C0G. That gives you very good thermal stability. Um, you've got to be rated to at least 100 volts. Um, power supply caps aren't so sensitive. Um, in theory, if the, the device is working correctly, the voltage should never get above 10 volts. So anything higher than that will be fine. Really, any capacitance is fine. It's, it's, it's not got to do much in terms of storing energy. It's mainly just a, a buffer to, to smooth things out. Um, with the diodes, um, the, the absolutely key thing of, uh, with the diodes is the recovery time. So um, if you look at the time it takes for a 13.56 megahertz wave, um, you can only charge up for half the wave, which is uh, on the order of 30 nanoseconds. So if your diode has a recovery time of 15 nanoseconds, you're losing half of your available power. So you need as fast a recovery time as possible so you catch as much of that wave as possible. Um, I have messed around with uh, really low voltage diodes, like shock keys. Um, they work perfectly fine as well. Um, I've, as long as it's a fast recovery diode type, uh, it should work well in Guard Bunny. Um, the counter, any old 4-bit counter is fine. Just check the voltage, and uh, TSSOP is good. Um, again, the modulator, check your voltage, check your current ratings. Um, the LEDs are actually, uh, there's a couple of interesting trade-offs there. Um, so what you need to do to, to choose your LEDs is the first thing that you start off with is checking the voltage ratings on your chips. Um, that's the ultimate limit of you know, how high voltage can get, and, and the LEDs have got to keep it below that. So let's say you've got a logic family that's good up to 7 volts. That means you can put 3.5 volts maximum per LED. And that will dictate which colors you can use, because you know, blue LEDs are about 3-4 volts, red is about 1.8. Um, there's you know, different colors at different other places. Um, there's there's trade-offs. There's two trade-offs that you have to bear in mind when you're choosing forward voltage and forward current. Once you've picked your your um, your color that you want, or it, it's kind of related. But um, the forward voltage trade-off. If you have a higher forward voltage, like the the, the for the LEDs, the the capacity the power supply can charge up that much further before the LEDs turn on, which means that the high phase of Guard Bunny's signal is that much higher. Um, that means that Guard Bunny is effective because it's generating deeper modulation. It's, it's generating a better signal. If you have a lower forward voltage, it means that the diodes, the, the LEDs turn on sooner, so it's more visible, it's probably a bit brighter. 
Now I chose these, these red LEDs, uh, uh, you know, 1.8 volts forward voltage. Um, I chose them to be very visible for demos, and as it turns out, they work fairly well for, for protection as well. So um, you, you do have some flexibility. I actually have a guard bunny at home that has pink LED um, eyes. It's, it's the cutest thing ever, but you, you have to hit it with so much energy to make it turn on, it's ridiculous. Like this, this high power reader can barely do it. Um, forward current, um, higher forward current on the LEDs means your lights are brighter. There's more power going into it, there's, there's more light coming out. Um, if you lower your forward current, then um, Guard Bunny is again more effective because the diodes will be, the LEDs will be shunting less power away, which means again the voltage raise it, rises up again, you've got deeper modulation, but because you've got less current going through, it's shunting less power away, so when more power comes in, you have less ability to shunt power away, and you're more vulnerable to, to high power uh, killing, the, ta killing the, the, the bunny. So, to, to just kind of wrap up, um, it, it is V1, it's, it's proof of concept, it's, uh, it's the kind of thing that I, I, I built it to see whether it could be done and figured that it could be done. Um, that's about where it is. Um, it's, it, it, it works, as a proof of concept device, it works. But in my opinion, the, the weaknesses that it has are, um, I couldn't in good conscience start selling it because it's not good enough. It does work, it's proved the concept, it's, it's a new approach to uh, shielding RFID that I think needs to be out in the world, but I don't think it's ready for actual commercial sale yet. Um, but it is worthy of bringing to places like this and people like you and talking about it and see if we can't make it better. So um, yeah, lots of work to do, lots of, of help would be appreciated. And then um, just as a final note, um, take a note of this uh, GitHub address. Um, some point in the middle of next week, I will be uh, posting on there uh, all of the schematics, all of the PCB layouts, all of the Gerber files, the bill of materials, the placement details, even down to uh, like the, the, the Guard Bunny logos. All of it is going Creative Commons, um, commercial use allowed, but with attribution. Um, look for it on GitHub uh, next week when I'm back in civilization. Thank you. Okay, so we just have a few minutes for some quick questions and then I'll, I'll take some more questions out in the, in, in the lobby here. So, yes. So, how many people watched Shark Tank? How many people saw this on Shark Tank and thought of me? So, um, so this is uh, Signal Vault. Um, this was, it was pimped on Shark Tank. Um, this is a, a sheet of uh, uh, RFID shielding foil um, sandwiched against a, uh, a MyFair ultralight tag. And the idea is that the foil will try and block the signal, um, and if it doesn't, the MyFair ultralight is notoriously bad at playing anti-collision, and so the hope is that it'll stomp on the signal. So it's, it's kind of a similar idea, but the, the problem with it is you've got an RFID tag right next to a shield. So you've got two defenses that are directly in opposition with each other. And then you've solved the problem of uh, protecting yourself from RFID privacy by introducing another RFID tag, which doesn't really sound like the right approach to me. So, I mean, I've, I've done a bunch of testing with this. Um, Guard Bunny is actually more effective than Signal Vault. It provides better protection range. Um, if you move it in the three primary axes in, in terms of distance from the, the tag and the reader before it reads, um, Guard Bunny does pretty good against Signal Vault. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan. The, the stated use case for this is you have to get two of them and sandwich them either side of your card. Whereas Guard Bunny is intended, you just drop it in your wallet and walk away. So. There's your answer. Yes. The wavelength doesn't really matter. It's, it's more about inductance. You're dealing with M field. You're not looking at, at radiated electromagnetic uh, energy. You're looking at an oscillating magnetic field. So it's, it's really the, the coil dimensions and the, the, the capacitance that tunes it up. It's uh, one over two, uh, frequency is one over two pi root LC. Um, just standard resonance circuit. Yes? 
Say again. What's the effect of stacking or sandwiching with Guard Bunny? What's the effect of stacking or sandwiching with Guard Bunny? So Guard Bunny doesn't actually care which side of the tag it's on. So I can, I can show you actually real quick. So if I put Guard Bunny on top of the tag and then put the whole mess on the reader, it doesn't read. I can bring Guard Bunny slowly away and it reads about here. Um, and then since I'm here, just to show you the comparison with the signal vault, um, exactly the same test. You can see why I'm, I'm unimpressed with this thing. Um, yeah, I mean, you can, you can stack them, you can do all kinds of things. It, it, you're essentially trying to confuse the reader, so the more shit you can throw at it, it just it works. <laughs> yes? So I'm, I'm going to go with uh, someone else has solved that problem and I don't need to worry about it. Um, I mean, it's, it, it's designed for commercial use. It's designed to be used with, you know, this, this is an RFID tag, but it does have a mag stripe as well, and it's designed for this. So I, I, I'm just, I'm assuming they figured it out. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Uh, question at the back. So the, there's one paradigm that I thought of for Guard Bunny that um, it was actually created by, uh, it wasn't created by HID, but HID sells a very similar product. Um, the idea is you have a, a, a clamshell ca a case where you've got, you, you slot the tag in and then you've got a metal back and then you've got a, a clip on the top and when you squeeze the clip, the two kind of hinge apart like this. Um, in that scenario, Guard Bunny would work very, very well. Um, because then, you know, not least you can guarantee the antenna placement as well. So yeah, that would actually be a very, very good use case. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. You can, Guard Bunny is designed to take any size of antenna as long as it can be tuned, uh, any size of antenna, any system as long as it's 13.56. So if you want to print one out on a flex PCB, laminate it in the middle of paper and then insert it into a page in your passport, yeah, that would work. I, I would actually quite like to see that. <laughs> uh, yes, question. Yeah, you can do that. You can put a button on it that disables it. Um, that's, that's not hard to do. Um, the, the intended use case for it was that um, my, my issue is that uh, at the moment, RFID tags can be read without leaving your wallet. Uh, that, that's not an acceptable use case from, from where I sit. So um, this goes in your wallet. Now you've got the exact same use case as with any other form of payment. You have to pull it out of your wallet, give it to someone, and then it works. All right, and I think I'm out of time, so thank you, everyone. <laughs>